All right, if you have your Bibles tonight, let's open up to Revelation chapter 20 today. Jumping straight into it, huh? Revelation chapter 20 today. Now, we'll probably get more into the end times towards the end of this series. I thought it was fitting as we get towards the end of the series to talk about the end times. But tonight, I felt like the Lord wanted to touch on something that actually I talked about on Sunday. How many of you were here on Sunday? Let me just see. Okay, good. We got a good amount of you that were here on Sunday. On Sunday, I felt like the Lord said to talk about eternity, and I feel like the Lord's said tonight to talk about eternity as well. So the title for tonight's message is Eternity. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. While you're turning to Revelation 20, I have just a little funny interaction that I had a couple weeks ago that I thought was really funny. I was walking over here in the parking lot, and I ran into a lady who's maybe maybe 50 or so who uh, apparently got bit by a rat. Isn't that, that's like one of the grossest things that can happen. But uh, she said she was just walking through the sewer and got, no, I'm just kidding. She, she said that she was reaching in her fireplace to like fix something, and I guess there was a rat in there that just latched onto her hand and bit her. And this is how the conversation went, though. She said, uh, I thought this was just a funny interaction. She said, said, yeah, I got bit by a rat when I reached in my fireplace. She said, so now I have a viral infection. She goes, don't worry, though. You won't get it unless I kiss you, which I'm not going to. And I was like, <laughs> like, thank you. My wife would appreciate that if you did not. <laughs> I just laughed. I thought that was so funny. She's like, don't worry. You won't get it unless I kiss you, which I'm not going to. thought that was good clarification. I'm glad you said that. Tonight, we're talking about eternity, and I just want to answer two questions tonight. Two questions. Question number one, how do our lives affect our eternity? Question number two, how does our eternity affect our lives? Let's start with question number one. How do, how do our lives affect our eternity? Our lives and our choices that we make here on this earth absolutely affect our entire eternity. According to the Bible, every single living human being will at one point end up dead and in one of two places, heaven or hell. That's it. That's what the Bible talks about. There's no in between. There's no place for the people that like kind of did, did what they were supposed to. And tonight I want to talk about how our lives affect eternity. I want to talk a little bit about salvation. I think it's really important for believers to understand how salvation works, right? Are we saved by grace? Well, we'll walk through the Bible, but of course, absolutely. Does that mean that what we do doesn't matter? No, it doesn't say that either. So what does it say? So I want to walk through a little bit of how our lives impact our eternity and what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says again that we end up in one of two places. There's no middle ground. In fact, in Revelation, I believe it's in Revelation 3.16, that says that God said, either be hot or cold, don't be in the middle. Because if you're lukewarm, it says, I will vomit you. God will vomit you out of its mouth. It uses that word. So it says we must make a choice in our life. We can't be in the middle. And it makes sense that in eternity, there's no neutral zone. It's a choice. It's either heaven or hell. Revelation 20:15 says this, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me explain a little bit about salvation. If you surveyed random people, on the street, you would probably find that most people will give you an answer about heaven and hell if they believe in it. They'll say, yeah, I believe it. And then you ask them, are you going to heaven? And most people will probably say, yeah, I think so. I'm a good person, right? That's, that's, that's what most people would believe is that they're going to heaven because they're a good person. Not understanding that the Bible makes it clear you cannot be good enough to get to heaven. You can't do it. Turn to the person next to you, say you are not good enough to get to heaven. Come on, give some real truth tonight. Let them know you're not good enough to get to heaven. I, I am not good enough to get to heaven. I can't earn my way into heaven. I can't do well enough. I, I personally, Jonathan, I cannot earn my way into heaven. I'm not good enough. Can't get there. Can't earn it. Being a good person is not how you get to heaven. That's not how you do it. You remember the, Jesus gave an example uh, of a Pharisee and a tax collector, the Pharisee who is living their life trying to be strict with the rules, trying to live a good life before God, and a tax collector who is living in a moral life. And it says, they both went up the hill and the prayers look different. The tax collector's prayer, or let me start with the Pharisee. The Pharisee's prayer looked like, God, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector, a wicked man, someone who's not doing right. God, I thank you that I, I tithe, God. I thank you that I make good choices. 
and all of that. And then the tax collector had said he was so ashamed of the way that he had been living, he couldn't even look up to heaven, but instead he just beat his chest and said, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And it says the tax collector went down justified and the other guy did not. Now the tax collector lived a more sinful life and yet he was the one justified and the other guy who lived a better life, who was tithing, doing a lot of the things that he was supposed to do as a Pharisee, it says that that one went down unjustified. Why? Because you can't do good enough to earn your way into heaven. You can't do enough to earn your way into the, the throne of the Lord. It's by grace and grace alone that we, are been, that we have been saved. Somebody say, thank God. Thank God that we're not saved by our works. Thank God that we are saved by grace, the grace of Jesus. You cannot out the grace of God. His grace is bigger than your sin. His grace is greater than your sin. So we are absolutely saved by grace. The Bible is so very clear about that. But here's something important to understand. But how are we saved by grace? Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, is what Jesus said. You cannot get to the Father in heaven except through Jesus. So this kind of trendy belief system that a lot of people have doesn't line up with the Bible where they say, hey, whatever works for you. If believing in Jesus works for you, do that. If believing in someone else works for you, do that. If believing in nothing works for you, do that. According to the Bible, that, that doesn't fly. If the Bible is real, then that is a bad method to live by. If the Bible is true. Now imagine, you've probably heard this example before, but imagine if I told you, hey, you want to come over to my house? Here's how you get there. And I give you directions and you say, no, I want to, I want to go the opposite way, but I still want to arrive at your house. Well, you can go whichever way you want, but you're not arriving at my house, right? You'll, you'll arrive somewhere else. And it's like that with Jesus. Jesus said, you want to arrive at my house in heaven? He said, you can't do it except through me. And we say, no, Jesus, I, I am going to arrive at your house, but I want to do it through something else, my way. And you can say that all you want, but you're not going to end up in the house of the Lord. And we need to end up in the house of the Lord. It's like the most important thing ever in our whole life. Number one, by far, is to make sure that we are on the right track to heaven for eternity. Eternity is so big compared to this life. The only way to end up with the Father in heaven is through Jesus. Did you know that we can't enter into heaven if we have any sin at all on us? If we have even just one sin on our life, we're disqualified from going to heaven. That's why I never sin. No, that's ridiculous. <laughs> even just one. We must be washed by the blood of Jesus. The, the, the Bible says that when we confess our sins to him, he forgives us and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. That's two steps. Step number one, he forgives you. He chooses to overlook the sin, not hold it against you. Step number two, he washes you as if it even never happened. So that when you show up to the judgment seat of the Lord, and now it's your turn to get judged, God looks at you and he sees spotlessness. Why? Not because you never sinned, but because you received the free gift of grace and were washed by the blood of Jesus. This is why before Jesus died, no one went to heaven. Did you know that? Before Jesus died, they either went to Abraham's bosom, which was a place, that's what it was called, paradise, not with the Lord, but paradise, a good place, or they went to Hades, a bad place. It wasn't until Jesus died that now you didn't only go to a good place, but you got to actually go to his place. And that's because God cannot be in the presence of sin. You cannot with sin come into the presence of God. It's why the priests, when they used to go in where the Ark of the Covenant was, they would tie a little bell around their ankle. And if they weren't clean for some reason, they would go into the presence of God and they would just drop down and die. And so they would tie a bell and a rope. That way, if the priest stopped moving, you don't hear the bell going ding-a-ling-a-ling, then you pull him out because he's dead. Why? So you don't have to go in there. You just use the rope. It's because we cannot take our sin into the presence of God. That is why being a good person can never get you to heaven. Because you, no matter how good of a person you are, you have sinned and you have that on you unless it's washed. So it's important for us to understand this because we not only need to know this for ourselves, we need to be able to explain this to someone. So that when you talk to your cousin or your friend or your neighbor and they're like, no, I think I'm on the right track. I think I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Right? I, 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 I do my thing. I try to help people. I'm, I try to be kind and all that. So I think I'm going to heaven. True love 
looks for an opportunity to say, hey, I hear where you're coming from, but let me show you what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that salvation cannot be earned through good works, that it has to be through the blood of Jesus. We cannot earn our salvation. It is through grace that we are saved. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, that it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Your salvation, it's saying, don't be boastful saying, yeah, I'm saved because of my works. It's saying, no, 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 you're not saved because of your works. You're saved by your faith in Jesus and receiving the gift of God. That's how you're saved. So don't boast about being saved. Yeah, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Again, we cannot earn our way to make it to the house of the Lord. We have to be totally spotless to be able to enter into heaven. And that is unattainable by any human, except one, really, Jesus. He was the spotless lamb. He lived a perfect life instead of us so that we can take his place and be clothed with his righteousness instead. So are we saved by grace? Not a rhetorical question. Are we saved by grace? Yes, absolutely we are. We cannot earn salvation. But here's something to keep in mind too. This is where people get confused sometimes. Some people say, well, we're saved by grace. That means I can say the prayer, Jesus saved my life, and then I can go and just live however and totally ignore the Lord and do whatever I want, and it's good. I'm saved by grace. But that's not what the Bible says either. The Bible doesn't say that. Look at Matthew 5, 29 through 30. It says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cast it far from you. Some people talk about Jesus and the way they talk about him is like he was like just a hippie. Like, hey, do whatever feels good. Love. Listen, he was all about love. He's like the definition of love. But he's also love and truth. The Bible says he was full of grace or love and truth. Both. Jesus wasn't preaching just do whatever you want. Jesus preached the truth in love. So he said, if your right eye causes you to sin, he, Jesus said, pluck it out and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, obviously, clearly, he's not speaking literally. I don't want to see a bunch of one-handed beyonders next week. He's not speaking literally, but what he's trying to do to us is he's trying to paint a picture that this life compared to eternity and this life living of sin is not worth jeopardizing eternity. So Jesus is pointing out here that sin can drag us all the way to hell. Now, how does that work if we're saved by grace? It's not because the sin isn't covered by the grace, but it's that the sin often causes us to walk away from the Lord. That when you continue to live in sin, you often make the choice. You start to walk away from the Lord. He doesn't walk away from you. You walk away from him. And you can't do that. You have to stick with the grace of salvation and the life of salvation. It's like this. Imagine I have four little kids. Imagine if there were like some dogs that were over there, some rabid dogs, like some big German shepherds or something. And, and my daughter, my six-year-old daughter gets scared. And I said, hey, stay right with me. I'll protect you. And then she takes off running right into the dogs. And then the dogs bite her. Is that because I didn't want to protect her or because she left my protection? because she left the protection. See, God, God, what he will not do is God gives us, well, let me say what he does first. God gives us free will. God does not force us to choose him. God will not grip your wrist with an iron hand and say, no, you may not go. He will just use his words and tell you, don't go, don't do it, don't do it, stay, stay with me, don't do it, it's not worth it. But you still have to make the choice to go. Why? Because if he just gripped your wrist and forced you to say, you're not even making a choice anymore. He's now just manhandling you essentially and just forcing you, no, you will serve me. And that's not real servitude at all. That's not real love. So God does give us the choice. But we, when we say God, when we call Jesus, it says we must confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord, for those of you taking, uh, who have taken level two, in fact, let me see if, if you've taken level two, what does Lord mean? Let's see. Master decision maker, owner, controller. That's exactly right. When you say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, you're saying, Jesus, you are my owner. Lord means owner, master, controller, decision maker. So when you say that, God is asking you to live by that. Again, not a perfect life. 
The tax collector went down justified, living an imperfect life, yet having a humble heart before God. So if our sin can drag us to hell, does that again now mean that we're saved by works? We can't sin. No, see, this is where some people just get a little confused and some people take it. Oftentimes what we do with the word is we take one side without the other and we just focus on the one side and we're missing the whole picture, right? So they take just the we shouldn't sin aspect and then they start talking and people start talking as if not sinning is what gets us to heaven or doing good is what gets us to heaven. That's inaccurate. And then some people talk about the grace of God in a way that the Bible doesn't paint it, which says, because you're saved by grace, do whatever you want. And you're good. We're all good. We're all saved by grace. And that also is not what the Bible preaches. How do we know that the Bible doesn't just preach that all we have to do is say to Jesus, you're my Lord, and then everything's good? Because Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, through 23, he said, many will say to me in that day. Everybody say many. Many. This is a scary, scary scripture. To me, the scariest one in the whole Bible. It says this, many will say to me in that day when they're being judged, they'll say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many wonders in your name? And it says that Jesus will look at them and declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, Jesus is saying, these are people who call Jesus their Lord. These are people that say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. If you ask them who they believe in, or if they're religious, they say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. He's my Lord. They say it with their mouth, but Jesus says, he'll look at them and say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So even though people call Jesus their Lord, they aren't getting in, apparently. Some of us talk like we're submitted to the Lord, but our lives don't reflect it. My, my daughter, who's again, six years old, <laughs> it, this gave me a great picture of how I sometimes and we sometimes operate with the Lord. But we were playing with her little, it was like a little doll or something. And she was like, daddy, she was like, come look at this doll. And so I went over there and I was like, oh my goodness, so pretty and all this. And she said, what, what outfit should I put on her? You pick the outfit, daddy. And I said, mm, you know what, baby? I said, I like this one. Let's put this one on her. And you know what? She responded, she goes, mm, no, we're, we're not going to do that one. <laughs> and I said, baby, you asked me to pick. And she's like, yeah, but not that one. I said, well, okay, that one. Mm, I think we're going to do this one. <laughs> I'm like, why'd you, why, why'd you ask me to pick? Right? And then it hit me. We do that to the Lord all the time. We're like, Lord, we're here in worship at Beyond. We're like, Lord, you are in charge, Lord. You direct me. You lead me. And the Lord's like, okay, go do this. And we're like, no, 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 Lord, not that though. <laughs> not that though, Lord. And it ought not be so. If we call Jesus our Lord, we should treat him like our Lord. So what is it then? We're saved by grace, but yet sin can drag us to hell. How does that work? Again, it's not the sin itself that is too big that the grace of God can't save you from it. It can, but it's the sin that often causes us to depart from the Lord and leave serving the Lord. So what does it look like to depart from the Lord? Well, there's a scripture in Hebrews 10 that reveals to us how it is that we, after receiving the knowledge of truth of Jesus and confessing him as Lord, can still end up being dragged away with sins. It says this in Hebrews 10, 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So catch what this is saying. If after you received the knowledge of truth, if after you received Jesus as your Lord and caught what the truth is, if after that you are still sinning willfully, it says there's no sacrifice for the sins, meaning those sins are not washed away, meaning you are in trouble. That's what that means. Well, what does it mean to sin willfully? There is a difference between somebody who wants to do right before God, wants to honor God, wants to serve God, but is struggling with sin. That's the tax collector. That's who the tax collector was in that picture. The tax collector was somebody who's struggling with sin. He's doing things that are dishonoring God, but he didn't want to. He humbled himself and said, God, I don't want to be that way. Forgive me, help me. And that person was justified. But then you have people that sin willfully. Sinning willfully means you're sinning with your full will behind it. It's like an indifference to sin. You don't care. You know it dishonors the Lord, but it doesn't matter to you. You want to do it, so you're going to do it anyway. That's a scary place to be. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and you have sin in your life and you are totally okay with it, that is a scary place to be. 
And according to the scripture, you could have, let me give you just a couple of examples. You could have Dale over here who's sinning way more than Jesse over here. And yet he's justified because he does not want to be that way. And he's striving to be right before God. And he's repenting and his heart is to do right before God. And Jesse over here is sinning less than Dale. But yet the sin that he's committing, he doesn't care that it's sin or not. He wants to do it anyway. And he's not justified. See, the posture of our heart, the will inside is really, really important. God does not measure, thank God, he does not measure the amount of sin and say, well, you've sinned more, you've sinned less, so you're in heaven. Thank God he just didn't put a cap and say, you get a thousand sins in your life. I would have passed that up by like 14, right? (laughs) Maybe even nine. (laughs) I don't know. He didn't do that. But what he did say is your heart must will to do right before God. And if you get to the place where you are sinning willfully now, you need to have a a little dose of the fear of God in your life. Sinning willfully looks like this. Sinning willfully looks like something that you know is wrong before God. Something you know it's sin, you know the Bible says not to do it, you know the Bible says it's wrong. And yet you don't care enough that it's wrong that you're trying to stop. You're not, you're not trying to get over this. You're not trying to move past it, but you're struggling. You're in bondage. God has compassion for people that are in bondage, but they want to be free. God has so much compassion for that. But even if you could be freed, you wouldn't want to because you like it too much. Even if you could be freed, you, you wouldn't choose to because you don't want to. And again, let me read to you. This is the word. Are we reading the word tonight? Yes, we are. Hebrews 10, 26. Let me read it one more time. If we sin willfully... After we have received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. No sacrifice, no entrance into heaven. Because your sins must have been paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Since I got saved, I have not stopped sinning. Let me rephrase that. (laughs) This is not, I'm not confessing things tonight, okay? No. Since I've been saved, it's not that I no longer ever sin. Now, God has freed me from some things, and he will do that. Your sin, as you walk with the Lord, should become fewer and far between. You shouldn't sin the same amount 10 years after you knew the Lord that you did 10 years before. You should should be growing. We should be going in the right direction. But perfection is a goal that's not attainable. We will never arrive at perfection. But I know this, ever since I gave my life completely to the Lord, when I recognize that there's something that I'm doing or a way that I'm acting that's wrong for God, I do not have a will just to let it linger. I want to get that out. And even if I'm struggling to get it out, I want to. I want to do right before God. It's really important. Look at what Romans 7, 18 through 20 says. Again, this is pointing to the will that we have inside. It says this, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Catch this. For the good that I will to do or that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I will not to do, that's what I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. He's saying this. If I'm doing something that is wrong and I don't want to do that, I'm struggling with it, but I don't want to be that way. The word is saying, that's not even counted against you. That's not you that's doing it. It's the sin. There's sin within you, but that's not you that's doing that. And the blood of Jesus washes that clean. Again, contrast this with the verse we just read before, which says, if we sin willfully after receiving the truth, there's not a sacrifice for that sin. It is important that when we say, Jesus, you are my Lord, Jesus, you are my savior. You have my life, that we live our life in a way that honors that. We live our life in a way that doesn't allow sin to linger in our life. So now someone may be sitting here thinking, I don't like this message. This message kind of gets all up in my grill, up in my face. This message freaks me out, right? Makes me uncomfortable. Well, Philippians 2.12 says this. Catch what it says. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now so much more in my absence, it says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, is what it says. Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When you think about your salvation, 
Don't think about it how most people think about it. Most people think about their salvation very casually. Like, no, I think I'm good. I'm a good person. I think I'm good. But the Bible says, no, don't think about your salvation like that. Why would you? It's eternity. It says, think about it with fear and trembling. It's like a heavy dose of reality that this is a really, really big deal. Could you imagine if you were moving to a new house? And as you were getting ready to move, the, the realtor told you, by the way, they said, you know, you're living in this little valley and right up there on the hill, there's this huge dam. And, uh, and they said, and you know, there, I just want to let you know, there's some forecast that it may burst sometime soon. I don't know. But let's get you in. Now, if you have any brains at all, you don't just let that sentence go by lightly and say, okay, how much was it again, by the way? Okay, let's move forward. If you have any brains at all, you dig into that, right? And you say, wait, wait. What do you mean it could burst like soon? What does that mean? Well, that means, you know, it could like flood and kill, kill kind of kill everyone. <laughs> if you have any brains at all, then you take that seriously. And hell is real and it's not a death like drowning that is miserable and then it's gone. It is eternal forever in torment. If when you die, you know you're going to move. Think very carefully about where you're moving. This says again, work it out with your, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Take it incredibly seriously. So let me see if I can summarize question number one, which is how do our lives affect eternity or eternity or how do the choices that we make affect our eternity? Let me see if I can summarize it really quickly. We're saved by grace. We cannot earn salvation. That's why Jesus had to come and die as a perfect human being so that we could receive his righteousness and instead he received our punishment. So we cannot earn salvation. So if you ever talk to anybody that says they think they're going to heaven because they're a pretty good person, love them enough to tell them, not yell at them, that doesn't do any good, but love them enough to open up the Bible and say, hey, can I just tell you something? The Bible says that we can't be good enough to go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says we can't earn it. Why? Because even one sin in our whole life disqualifies us from going to heaven. We have to receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus. So we are saved by grace. But even after we're saved, according to the Bible, some people buy into a doctrine that's not biblical, which is once saved, always saved. That you say the prayer, now you're good forever. That is not true. Otherwise, what Jesus said would be inaccurate when he said, many will call me Lord, but I'm not, they're not coming in here. Well, if you just have to say the prayer and that's it, then why aren't they getting in? It's because there's more to it than that. After we call Jesus our Lord, we must have a will to do what's right before him and not be sinning willfully. Check yourself tonight. Are there any sins that you know are wrong before God, but you don't care enough to fight to stop doing it? You like it too much. Evaluate yourself. That, that's, it's really, really important that we evaluate ourselves, right? We are working out our salvation with a dose of fear and trembling, with a dose of reality, because eternity is a long, long time, right? A hundred billion years will pass, and we're not even halfway done. Still going. And here this, on this earth, it's a hundred years maybe that we get here on this earth. You, we got to make sure that, that if there's sin in our life, that that it's not because we don't care to get it out. It's there, it's there because maybe we're, again, maybe we're struggling. Maybe we, some of us are that tax collector who had many sins that he was dealing with, but he humbled himself. He did not want to be that way. Some of us may be in that position where we are sinning constantly, but it's not who we want to be. We, want, we don't want to sin. And that's really, really important that we don't allow our will to leave us. And here's why sin, Jesus said, it's better to cut off your right hand than to allow it to keep sinning and it'll drag you all the way to hell. Here's why. It's not because sin removes you from the grace. The grace is meant for sin. But as you keep sinning and you just let it linger, you let it linger long enough and you'll notice your will to not do it anymore kind of goes away. And you go from struggling with sin to now sinning willfully. To where now you're not, you're not even struggling with it anymore. It's not that you don't want to be that way, but you're struggling. Now you're just doing it because you like it. And now that's where, that's where sin can drag you to hell, not because the grace doesn't cover your sin, but because sin can drag you out of the 
protection of the Lord and out of the grace that God has for you, which is to live a life where your will is to do right before God. Is this making sense? I hope you guys are catching because I want you to hear. I don't want anyone walking out of here thinking either of the ditches on both sides. I don't want anyone walking out of here thinking that we're saved by works. The Bible is so clear we're not. And I don't want anyone walking out of here thinking that once we say, Jesus, you're my Lord, then we do whatever we want. Neither one of those things are true. If we call Jesus our Lord, the expectation is that we live our life striving to live up to that. So number one, how does our life affect our eternity? It completely affects it. What we do here on our life is, in fact, the only thing that affects eternity. The decisions we make, the decision to accept the free gift of salvation, the decision to not depart from the Lord, the decision to, in our entire life, if there's sin in there, to strive to do right before God. And it's not out of a condemnation either. I got freed many years ago from condemnation. I used to beat myself up when I would miss things. I would hold it over my head. I remember one time messing up and sinning, and I remember coming to the Lord as maybe a 20-year-old young man, and I remember just getting in the presence of God, and I was so angry that I messed up, and I just said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. And for like five minutes, I just kept saying it over and over and over. And I remember the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, after about five minutes, he just stopped me and said, Jonathan, he said, you know, I forgave you the first time you said it. And that was such a deep revelation to me because I, it almost feels like the bigger the sin the more you have to like make up for it by just apologizing and doing good work. That's the beauty. And that's one of the reasons I love the Lord so much is the moment that you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He forgives you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Now, question number two. Question number one was how do our lives affect our eternity? Question number two is how does our eternity affect our lives? There was a well-known atheist who said that something to the effect of it actually kind of bothers him when he hears Christians that believe in heaven and hell and don't really say anything. He's an atheist and he's a well-known famous atheist. And he said, if Christians really believed in heaven and hell, and if they're really loving, they would be saying something. Which is why he was actually, I think, alluding to the fact that Christians don't really believe that. If they really believed it, you would like see it in the way that they live. They would tell people because they wouldn't in their right minds just let people go to hell if they really believed that and not say anything. It's one of the most profound points I've ever heard, and it's from an atheist, which is that if Christians believe in eternity, our lives should reflect that. Our lives should reveal that we live for eternity. I heard someone else say something. Oh, it's such a good line, and I'm going to butcher it right here, but follow me anyway. I heard somebody say, suppose you were put on court, and the thing you were being condemned for was being a Christian. Is there enough evidence in your life to prove that you were? to condemn you for that? Or could they not find enough evidence? No, it, I don't think they are a Christian. Their life doesn't really show it. Is there enough evidence in your life that they could find to show and condemn you as a Christian if you got put on trial for one? We should have evidence in our life. Eternity should affect the way we live. When you think, when you think about your life in perspective of eternity, it changes everything, right? If you think about it this way, what if, if somebody told you, hey, tomorrow, I just want to let you know, you won the lottery and tomorrow you're getting $52 million. Somebody say, praise the Lord. How many of you would, would be willing to receive for the Lord's sake $52 million? Let me see. <laughs> if somebody said that tomorrow, it almost doesn't matter what happens today. You still got joy, right? Because tomorrow you're getting $52 million, right? You could spill coffee all over your outfit. Normally you'd be furious, right? Your tire could pop. Normally you'd be all up in arms, but nothing's going to steal your joy now because you know tomorrow getting $52 million, right? I'll buy myself a new outfit and I'll buy myself service for somebody to come and keep it clean and wash my clothes. I'll buy everything, right? I'll buy a mansion and all that. Well, if we really believe in eternity compared to this life, this life is so short, it's like a day compared to our whole life even longer. If we really believe that, then we as believers, it should affect our life in one way that our joy can't be stolen. Because we know, no, at the end, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be living on streets of gold. And the, Jesus said he's going up there to prepare mansions for us. Now, I know what mansions look like here on this earth. I can only imagine what a mansion looks like in heaven where there are literal streets of gold. But if we believe in eternity, the first thing is we shouldn't be easily having our joy stolen. Because we know no, we're, we're, we're going to the place that's so much better. And it's heaven is so much better than $52 million. Some of you are like, are you sure, though? It's 52 mil. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, it's better than $52 million. 
How do we know? Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 24 through 27. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, does anyone desire to go after the Lord in, in this place? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Now, Jesus doesn't understand. Jesus, that's not a good sales pitch. If you want to get anyone to do something, don't start by saying, hey, you want to do this? Deny yourself. <laughs> right? It's like, it's like if somebody's trying to sell you food and they're like, okay, you're going to eat this, but you're going to have to deny yourself to get through it. It's like, what? <laughs> Sounds terrible. <laughs> Who wants to eat that? <laughs> Jesus said, if you desire to come after me, he didn't say, if you desire to come after me, I'm just going to give you all the riches in the world. He said, if you desire to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are some of my life verses. But then it continues in verse 26. For what profit or what good does it do to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will it give a man in exchange for a soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? For the Son of Man, or Christ, will come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Now, salvation is the free gift of grace, but did you know that the Bible talks about in heaven, we will receive rewards in heaven based on how we live our life here. Now, it doesn't specify what that looks like, but the Bible says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven based on what we do here on the earth. I don't know if that means somebody's mansion when they get to heaven has a pool and somebody's doesn't. Maybe somebody has a water slide, right? And in heaven, everybody goes to Bill's house because he's got the water slide. I have no idea what it looks like, but I know this. Jesus said, store up for yourself, not treasure here, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven that'll last for eternity. So for some, somehow, what we do here on earth affects the treasures that are stored up in heaven. And then it asks a good question. It says, what does it profit somebody if they gain the whole world? They're now, maybe they're the leader of the world. They have everything they could have ever wanted, but then they lose their own soul for all of eternity. What good is that? I said this on Sunday. I said several of these things I'm about to say on Sunday in the message. But you know, for one thing, did you know, and we know this, but there were people in the 1920s who were incredibly rich, had everything they could have ever wanted. Some people were multimillionaires and could afford anything they wanted, and they're all dead, all of them. Anybody who is an adult in the 1920s is dead. And yet, in the moment, they felt like whatever they had like that was everything, right? We have all the riches, we can do whatever. And there were a lot of rich people that lived back then and have died and we don't know about them and we don't care because they're gone, they're dead. But to them, they felt like in the moment, they felt the same way you and me feel now, which is like, this is everything. Me, me gaining wealth here, me being recognized here, me being promoted here. To them, that was everything. And now they're dead and they're gone and there's one thing they care about and that's, did they end up in the right place or not? All of a sudden, all the riches they accumulated, they don't care one bit now. It doesn't matter anymore. We cannot spend our life on things that are passing away. This is the example I gave on Sunday. But if you had a friend that went to an Airbnb for a week, they said, hey, we're going to rent an Airbnb for a week. And they said, when we get there, they said, we're going to spend all of our life savings to upgrade the place. We're going to get a pool built. So we already hired somebody to come build the pool. We hired somebody to fix up the kitchen. To repaint, we hired everybody. We spent all our life savings on it. You as a good friend should throw your arm around them and say, hey, goofball, why in the world, maybe not that terminology, in love, say, hey, buddy, why in the world would you spend everything you have on something that you're just passing through, on something that's not long-term? It's not your long-term landing place. Why would you do that? And yet we here with this life, we do that. We spend our whole life focusing on this life, which is just temporary, even though we're just passing through. This is not the real life. The real life is for eternity. James 4.14 says, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life, it says. It says your life is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Do you know what a vapor looks like? Like a puff of smoke. I know some of you know really well what that looks like. <laughs> 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 I 
That's terrible, huh? <laughs> you know, the Bible says that Paul was whipped a lot, but it also says that Paul was stoned at some point, so. <laughs> a vapor comes and goes. It's like this. Poof, it's there and then it's gone. And it says this. It says your life is like that. Like a vapor, it's just like poof, it comes and then it just fizzles away. That's your life. And we treat that moment, this lifetime, like it's everything. And it's not. I feel like it's like this. Anybody, anybody a dreamer in here? Like you constantly have dreams at night? Anybody? Some, of, some people I know just constantly have like very like spiritual dreams, right? Like they wake up and their dream always means something. Mine, I have dreams that are kind of random and all over the place. But... You know when you're in a dream and you're in a situation and in the moment it feels like this is everything, right? Your emotions, you're feeling it in the dream. You're feeling heavy hearted for whatever's happening. And then you wake up and you realize, oh, that's not the real thing, right? This is the real thing. And sometimes we're thankful for it and sometimes we're saddened, right? Because maybe in the dream you won $52 million. And so you're sad. Whatever it is, you wake up and in the moment you felt like that's the real thing. And then you wake up and you realize, oh, that's not the real thing. This is the real thing. I have a feeling that when we die and enter in eternity, we'll have like that type of feeling where it's like, oh, that's actually not the real thing. That's actually not the big deal. This is the big deal. And it's like we wake up and it's like all of a sudden, then we realize, man, I spent everything I had investing in that and that's gone. It's over. It's done. This is now, forever. Second Corinthians says, 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us. You can't hide from it. You can't get away from it. The people that say, man, I don't want to think about all that stuff. Not thinking about it does not mean that you will not end up before Jesus. Every single person will end up before the judgment seat of Jesus. And it says that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So again, there are rewards in heaven. And it says whether good or bad, and I believe punishments in hell based on what we've done here on earth. The Bible says that hell was designed for the devil and his angels. God's desire is not that anyone should go to hell. How do we know this? The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. The will of God is that nobody perishes, that everyone comes to repentance. In fact, God cared so much that he allowed his one and only son to be brutally tortured and murdered so that we could get to heaven. That's how much God cares. God cares so much that he sent his son to take our place so that we don't have to be condemned. But our job is to receive the free grace of the Lord and then strive to do right before him and not to allow sin to drag us away from him. Let me close with this. Philippians 1.21 says this, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is Paul talking. He says, for me, to live in my life is to serve Christ and to die is to gain. I win when I die. I don't know about you, I, well, I hope with you too, we win when we die. We don't lose, we win. But when we live, our life must be more purpose-filled than just to live for this life because it'll come and go like that. When you live for eternity, it changes your values. And when your values change, your decision changes. Your decisions change. All of a sudden, when God asks you to do something radical, when you keep it in light of eternity, it doesn't feel quite as radical, right? God may ask you one day to do something like sell your car or give your car away or sell your car and give the money to somebody that needs it. Maybe give your car to somebody that needs it. What if you spent your whole life saving up for that dream house and you finally got it and the next day God said, give it to somebody else, sign the deed over. Would we value the things of this world so much that we couldn't do it? Or do we recognize, no, you know what? This world, we're, we're just passing through. That's not my long term anyway. Lord, I'll do it. Or what if, what if we saved our whole life, bought that dream house, had the nice car, and then we died the next day? Then what's good? We can't transport it up there to heaven with us. All that stuff, all of a sudden, it just doesn't matter at all. All the Instagram followers, 
all the notoriety that we have, the popularity, all the comfort we had. Nobody ever gets to heaven and wishes they would have watched more movies. Nobody, and I enjoy a good movie. But nobody gets to heaven and thinks, stink. Never saw episode six of Star Wars, right? Don't know what happened. No one thinks that. When you die and go to heaven, you think, number one, how grateful you are that you went to the right place, but you also think and are awakened to the fact that this life should have been spent more in telling other people to make sure the other people around you end up in the right place. Most people in your sphere of influence, I will never meet. I, they won't hear the truth of the word of God by coming to beyond because most young adults do not come here. There are like hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of young adults in this region of Southern California. And yet 99.99999% will never step foot in here. You can't just say, well, eternity is such a big deal that I'm going to go ahead and just let the pastor or the person on stage reach the people that need to be reached. No, you have to do it. God doesn't call any believer to live their life for this life. This life is not worth living for because it's temporary. Eternity is worth living for. When you grasp eternity, when you grasp the reality of the big picture, your values, they'll change. They can't not change when you keep eternity in mind. They will change. There's only one thing worth living for. Let me say it this way. Actually, there's only one person worth living for, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one worth living for. He's so worth it. What I love about him, too, is when I gave up my life to serve him, he didn't make my life worse. He made it better, filled with joy. And the Bible never promises, by the way, which we talked about, I think, a couple weeks ago, but the Bible never promises that believers don't go through storms. Believers do go through storms. Some people fall away from the Lord because they think once they give their life to the Lord that they never go through a hard thing again. And then they go through a hard thing and they're confused. I don't understand it, so they fall away. But expect the storms to come because they will come. You don't get to live. No, none of us live a storm-free life because we live in a fallen world that's full of people that have made bad choices, full of realities that are part of life. But you know what God did promise us? He promised us that if we stick with him and seek after him, that when the storms come, we won't crumble. We won't fall apart, but we'll be able to stand strong through them and he'll walk us through it. Tonight, I believe there are some people in here that maybe you've made a decision to follow Jesus. But since then, when you truly evaluate yourself, you recognize, man, I think I may be in the category of people that have received the truth, but have been living however I want to willfully. I've been sinning and not that I'm just even struggling with sin and trying to do right, but I've kind of lived a life and lived a lifestyle where I don't really care about the fact that it's wrong. I just want to do it. And tonight you want to say, Jesus, I don't want to be that way anymore. Forgive me, God. I have good news. He'll forgive you that quick. He'll set you on the right path that quick. It's just how he is. So let's come before the Lord right now, each one of us. Lord, you've called us to live for eternity. You've called us to live with eternity in mind, God. You've called us to live for you. If there's any person in this place here tonight, and maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord, and tonight you want to accept and receive that free gift of salvation, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to in just a second. But if there are some people also in here that maybe you have accepted Jesus in your life, you've said the prayer, but as you evaluate your life, you recognize, man, I've been allowing sin to live freely in my life. And I want to recommit my life to Jesus that, that if sin comes in, I'm going to strive to get it out. And if I fall and mess up again, I'm going to get back up and keep going and strive to get it out. I'm not going to allow it to stay just because it's fun sometimes, just because I want to. If that's you in this place tonight and you want to either dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lord tonight with every head bowed, every eyes closed, would you just lift your hand in this place if that's you and you want to dedicate or rededicate? I see you, 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 I see you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to lead you to say a prayer, but it's not about repeating after me that, that does the, the thing that you need to do. It's about you from your own heart, meaning before the Lord what it is that we're saying. So maybe even some of you who didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. That's okay. 
as I pray, you pray along with me and you mean what you're saying. Everybody repeat after me, whether or not you raise your hand, every single person, repeat after me and say, Jesus, I give my life to you, to follow you, to serve you. You are my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and were raised from the dead for my sake. From this day forward, I am a follower of you. I will not allow sin to linger. I will strive to live righteously. And if I fall, I will get back up. In Jesus' name. And can we take just a couple of seconds here and would you just say out of your own mouth some words to the Lord, your own prayer before him. Just if you need to confess some things before the Lord, just confess it. Nobody needs to hear you. Don't stand on your chair and shout it. Just mutter before the Lord. Say, Lord, forgive me for that, Lord. And Lord, I thank you that your word says that when we confess our sins, God, you are both faith, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from any unrighteousness, Lord. It's as if we never even did it, Lord. And that is only by your grace, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Lord, help us to be the people that we are called to be and help us to live our life with eternity in mind, God. We declare this in the mighty name of Jesus. If you agree, would you say amen? Could we clap our hands tonight? Amen, amen, amen.